How does physics relate to calculus? Well, today we're going to find out. Okay, so suppose we have some object. It could be a particle, so like maybe even a little small steel ball, or perhaps a little vehicle, or some moving object that is going somewhere. We can actually use calculus to actually find out a few properties behind it, like velocity, acceleration, and many other different things as well. So, so let's suppose we had the displacement time function, the s of t equals 3t to the 3, plus 2t to the 2, plus 4t plus 6. We already know the velocity and acceleration functions for this. We just need to differentiate using the sum and power rule that we learned quite a while back. Hopefully you remember. So the s prime of t, the first derivative of our displacement time function, is equal to the velocity time function. This means that the slope of a displacement time function is actually the velocity. So, we differentiate. We bring the 3 down. 3 times 3 is equal to 9. We subtract 1 from the exponent. 90 squared is our result. Plus, we bring the exponent down. We multiply by the coefficient. We get 4t to the power of 1, or just 4t. And then, we just do the same thing. We presume that that is to the power of oops, power of 1. We bring the 1 down. We multiply by the coefficient. And hence, we just get 4, because t to the power of 0 is equal to 1. And then we differentiate our last equation to get the second derivative, which is equal to acceleration time function. So, 9 times 2 is 18. 18t. And then we simply differentiate our next term, and we get 4. Hence, we have four fundamental formulae that we can actually use and manipulate over the course of this actual video. So, what I want to do is I want to work out when the object reverses direction. Because the object it may drive in one direction for a little while, that may turn around, or, you know, a, a little particle or a little ball may go in one direction, and then it may change direction, depending on whether it collides with something momentarily. So what we need to do is we actually need to consider this contextually, in terms of physics. Well, let's have a look at the yeah, displacement time function. If we had a displacement time function, and the one I'm going to draw up is not representative of this uh, cubic up here, but it hopefully will help you conceptually. But uh, if, we, if we have a little car, it's headed in one direction. This is the displacement time function, so it's heading from the origin. And then it starts heading back. Then we know that the actual um, turning point here on the st function is where it changes direction. So because of this, the turning point on st is where the v of t, or the velocity time function, is going to equal zero, because vt is the first derivative of s of t. And as a result, we can actually calculate when the object is going to change direction. Again, you may remember from the last video, we have maximas and minimas, and I said, with the um, actual curve up here, the slope of the tangent being zero was generally a turning point. It can also be a horizontal inflection as well. And that's something we need to be aware of. We will need to check and make sure that it's truly when the object reverses direction, or whether the object just stops momentarily. So in order to do this, we take our vt function, 
and we solve for zero. So zero equals 9t squared plus 4t plus 4. Nice and straightforward. What we now need to do in order to solve an expression like this is use the quadratic formula that you're probably familiar with if you studied algebra before. So, t is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared take 4ac on 2a. And hence, we can find where the stationary points are on the actual uh, displacement time function, hence possibly where it turns around. So, we identify our components. A is obviously equal to 9, B is equal to 4, and C is also equal to 4. So, we get negative 4 plus or minus the square root of, and then we uh, plug in our terms, so we get B squared, so that's 16, take 4 lots of A, which is 9, and then 4 lots of 4. All over 2 lots of, and then we have A, which is 9. And hence here, we've got a little bit of a pickle, because when we actually simplify it, we get negative 4 plus or minus 16, take, and then we've got 9 times 4, which is 36, 36 times 4, which gives us a result of 144. All on 18. And the reason we've got a little bit of a pickle is because this square root term is actually negative. This means that there are no real roots. And as a result, it technically means that the object does not reverse direction. But hang on, what if it, we were to consider a different function? One where the object does actually have some kind of stationary point where it does reverse direction. Okay everyone, so I've just gone ahead here and I've actually gone for another example where we actually have real roots. Let me talk you through what I just did. Well, I started off with an s of t function, a displacement function, given by 1 third t to the 3, take 3t three squared plus 8t plus 5. I then differentiated. Go ahead and feel free to differentiate that as well, using the power rule and sum rule. I then got the acceleration time function. And, of course, we need to set the vt function equal to 0, because that's when we have the point where the object turns around. So, I use the quadratic formula because we may have two roots here, because we've got a quadratic. And I solved through for t. Again, I just substituted in the value of a, the value of b, and the value of c into this format here. So because it was negative 6 there, it's going to be positive 6 here. And then I did b squared take 4ac, which of course is just going to involve 6, 4, and then 1, and then c being 8. And once you've done that, you can simplify it down. Um, you should get to a point where it has 6 plus or minus the square root of 36 take 32 on 2, which is just 6 plus or minus the square root of 4 uh, divided by 2. And then we get 6 plus or minus 2 divided by 2. And then we simply make one of the examples plus and one of them minus, and we get a time of 4 and a time of 2, in terms of when this object turns around. So now what I've done is I've substituted back into the original displacement formula in order to make what's known as a motion diagram. So let me explain what this motion diagram is. I like the example of a car driving along. It drives along and t can be in minutes or hours, given the fact that this is in metres, you'd probably want to say that the car's moving reasonably slowly, and it's probably in seconds. But uh, the car's driving along, and at after, you know, two seconds, we obviously know, or t two seconds, we know that it's going to turn around. We want to know how far the car's travelled to get to that t equals two spot, though. 
because of course we might want to calculate how much petrol we used. Again, you probably want to look at longer distances, but uh, it's something feasible. There could be an application of it. So we get to two seconds, and then the car turns around. And then the car's travelling back towards uh, the origin. As you can see here, it's getting closer because at T seconds it's 11.67 metres away. And then when we get near 4 seconds, it's actually only 10.33 metres away. But um, what we want to consider here is the total distance travelled. And this brings me on to a little bit of uh, physics terminology. Total distance travelled is actually how far the car's gone, forward, and then back round. Whereas displacement is just how far it's gone in one direction. Again, it's uh, a vector or scalar quantity. You've probably heard of them before if you've studied trigonometry. But in order to draw a motion diagram, we just need these key factors in order to work out how far the car has travelled within the first four seconds of its motion. Because again, these are just points. And it started at five metres from the origin. So in order to draw a motion diagram, let's say that x is the origin here. It started five metres from the origin. And what happens is the car then drove up to 11.67 metres, at which point it turned around. It turned around and stayed until we got to 10.33 metres. Okay, so what does this actually tell us about the total distance travelled? Oh, we just need to add the components. 5 to 11.6. So we simply go 11.67, take 5. And you can always use your calculator in order to get that result. And we can see that the car, in the first two seconds up until this point, has actually travelled 6.67 metres, which is 6 and 2 third metres. So now what we do is uh, we have a look at adding on this extra bit here. So we go 11.67 take 10.33 because that's how far it went from there to there to get to the time of t equals 4 seconds. And as a result we get 1.33 metres. So 1 and a third metres. And there we can actually add on the results. So 6.67 plus 1.33 and we receive a value of approximately 8 metres. That's how far the car has travelled within the first 4 seconds of its journey. So as you can see, calculus relates to physics in many different ways. It's a very important application of calculus and can be quite uh, important in terms of actually looking at real world examples. So, with further ado, we'll uh, actually continue on with the second derivative in the next episode.